Welcome to Compliance Uncomplicated, an interview series dedicated to simplifying the unnecessarily complex world of risk and compliance. Hosted by Drata experts, each episode will tell a new story about high growth startups and other brands that are building compliance pathways towards a culture of security. Every business, industry, and team has unique challenges when it comes to building trust. And for many startups, compliance is one of the first stepping stones towards that pathway. In each episode, we'll hear from founders, visionaries, and those tasked with building a foundation of trust for their brand. It's time to unravel the jargon and abbreviations and uncomplicate compliance. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of Compliance Uncomplicated. And Compliance Uncomplicated is a podcast really focused on peeling back the complexity of security compliance and kind of what it means for startups and how other companies are using compliance to accelerate business and really build trust and with customers and create a security first culture. So I'd like to introduce my co-host, Matt. So Matt, do you want to take it away? Sure. Thanks, Kayla. So I'm Matt Hillary. I'm the vice president of security and our chief information security officer here at Drata. Um, I lead our compliance security and uh, corporate IT teams here. Um, you know, I've led several security programs in the past and um, just really excited about the work Drata is doing in this space uh, to automate some of the most painful parts of some of the security compliance programs that are out there. And uh, I always love these conversations with peers because I learned so much from them. And uh, today, just super, super excited to welcome Jeff Kudisman to the uh, uh, podcast. And Jeff is the Chief Information Security Officer at uh, Pinwheel. Uh, welcome, Jeff. Would would you be willing to take a few minutes to uh, introduce yourself uh, to our listeners and give some background on yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Matt. And uh, great pronunciation of my name. I know it's usually a difficult feat for many. Uh, so yeah, I'm Jeff Udisman. I'm the CISO of Pinwheel. I've been in a security space for about 15 years in a whole amalgam of different industries. Uh, I was in healthcare, consulting, uh, did some government work. And but lately in the past uh, four years, I've been focusing on fintech. Um, I was the CISO at uh, Daily Pay before my uh, tenure at Pinwheel, and uh, really excited to uh, talk about. And actually, just stepping back to Pinwheel, you know, we we're a fintech company, but there are tons of security implications, and uh, it's just like a super high priority for us. And not only me, but my other uh, members of my leadership team. So definitely really excited to uh, talk about it and and, uh, compliance and uh, have a great conversation. Love it. And I think that's something we've seen kind of because I'm on the sales side of things is really a lot of these regulated industries have this need, right, for frameworks and really There's not, it's not an option. It's just, when are you going to do it? And when are you going to get these frameworks? So I kind of want to take a step back though, and dive into your background kind of, and I know you're an advisor at Phylum and on the advisory board at Ithaca College. And so based on this experience, we can see, obviously you have passion for sharing insights as a CISO. And so how has being an advisor really um, shaped your own career and and how you approach security related efforts in your current role. Yeah, I mean, I really found a lot of value in being a, an advisor, where I can actually provide insight into being a CISO, what our challenges are, what my team's challenges are, so they can then craft their product based on those recommendations. I mean, the folks at Phylum, like I don't want to make a huge sales pitch. I mean, the, the product's absolutely phenomenal. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, but I mean, these guys are all like former three letter agency guys and they're, they're working on securing the, the open source uh, space um, in, in ecosystem. But again, to help them build their product in a user centric way and something that we can really find value out of it. Because sometimes if it's too research centric and it's not something that we can actually kind of action here, then that might not be super valuable. To be able to show them exactly what we need and what our pain points are has been phenomenal. Um, So yeah, I really like that side of advisory work. It's just, uh, it's cool to provide perspective and uh, yeah, I hope to do more of it in the future. 
Well, I'm impressed you're taking time to uh, advise folks on how to actually do security. It's one thing to read all the frameworks. It's one thing to have great connections with folks on, you know, their advice on how a security programs should be run, but it's another to actually take it and put it into practice. So, um, yeah, looking forward to learning from you today. One of the first questions I was going to ask you about was, um, you know, many companies have to take that first leap of faith into hiring their first security leader. Uh, different companies have different cultures, uh, different folks have different feelings towards, hey, how a security, uh, security program should be run. Uh, and so, you know, in your opinion, what should founders or first time security or CISO hires, uh, what should they look for in their first security leader or chief security officer? Yeah, I think there are a lot of uh, different, I guess, reasons behind why the first CISO is hired. It might not just be for traditional security that we've like learned through uh, our pasts, but it might have to do with a lot of like go to market and commercial. Like we want to show that our customers that we care about this. Um, but obviously that's not everything. I mean, we want to just kind of, and I know this is going to sound to be a cliche, but big security and from the beginning, but there truly is a lot of value in that. I mean, just setting like simple things like, um, you know, email protection and security awareness and training and these simple things uh, and just getting the culture. Like, for example, at Pinwheel, something that I really wanted to do because we were, you know, at the time I was the 40th or uh, 30-something um, employee, YubiKeys was something that I thought would be a great control to introduce because we have a very technical um, employee base. I mean, half of us are engineers. So I, I figured I wouldn't get that many complaints so introducing like a technology like that, that really has a tremendous amount of value in anti-phishing and social engineering was a really cool thing. So that's just, uh, I guess, a, an example, but just baking in usable security that's not going to inhibit us from building our product and becoming industry leaders, uh, I think it is great. And I think that's something that our executive leadership really noticed. Um, and yeah, and also just being able to speak to um, other cut like our prospects and our our customers i think it really gives them comfort to know that you know we're we're a fintech we deal with sensitive information we deal with sensitive transactions uh it's important that they know that there's somebody on our side that understands their concerns and they that understands um what they might want or what you know we're doing super well um so yeah i think there's a tremendous uh, value. I mean, I realize it's it's sometimes not a priority as like one of the first 10 hires, but I do think generally, depending on the industry, um, the type of data, the type of uh, criticality uh, of the data, um, that would definitely go into, I guess, the, the decision of how early to bring a CISO or a security resource on. Um, but I do think that um, it's just a, a great thing to do early on in the company's, um, you know, existence. Oh, I love that. I like that you started out with, hey, what makes the most sense on what tools to buy that would best marry up to the company's uh, needs, right, risks? Um, also like your point about um, being able to talk with customers. I assume being in fintech, you have what I'll call the revolving door of auditors. Seems like uh, third party, <laughs> right. you know, their third party insurance teams come in and have their list of questions they'd like to see. And sometimes, you know, the compliance totally. reports aren't enough and they, they want to talk to you directly. So having that kind of softer bedside manner approach to working with them, I, I think is, is a good thing to call it there. Are, are there any particular attributes you feel like folks should look for in a security leader? Yeah, I think, especially at an early stage startup, they need to really be a jack of all trades. And this is not just me like kind of boosting my bona fides here, but I think that just um, someone who is really great at pen testing might not be able to have those soft skills, be able to work with departments. I think that's one of those things. And, and Matt, I'm sure you have a lot of experience with folks like that, where they're brilliant in the specific areas of security that they serve. But I think your first security hire, depending on what you're looking for, again, if you're looking for a security leader, and that's what I'm just talking about here, they really just need to be able to speak intelligently about essentially everything. And if they can't, if they're they're not super familiar, again, like I don't know everything, but there might be areas where I could just you know do some research and then and educate myself enough where I can speak intelligently with our engineering teams or our, our legal representatives. Um, so I think that's very important. Someone who's willing to learn it all, learn it all fast, 
and um, and then execute. Um, yeah, so I think that's, um, and I'm sure, Matt. I mean, is that is that kind of what you, you're thinking as well in terms of uh, your career and what you've seen? Totally. I feel like I've learned the most when being thrown into the deep end and learning how to swim <laughs> when you really do have to talk with customers one day and then talk to the product team another day and be able to talk to our engineering team member uh, team members on another day, then be able to talk to our auditors the next and still kind of trying to dictate, you know, where we want to go as a security team and uh, what, what's the next risk to attack. Um, it, it's a fun balance. And so I think you hit on all the right points there. So um, no, I wanted to transition and talk a little bit about Pinwheel. Um, uh, honestly, I would love to learn more about what Pinwheel does specifically. And then about you personally, you know, and, and deciding to join Pinwheel. What are some of the things that, that you love about working there that brought you there originally? So essentially what Pinwheel does is we have connections to essentially all of the payroll platforms. So with that, um, one of our primary use cases, direct deposit switching. So if a, uh, a large traditional finance TradFi bank works with us, um, we will create a system that will allow them to quickly have customers switch their direct deposit information from their existing bank now to this new bank. Um, you can obviously do that manually, but it's sometimes an arduous process. You have to like go through HR and fill out forms. We just do it in a very simple um, you know, interface and it's very easy to do. Um, that's one use case, but then in terms of, uh, underwriting, uh, for, for lenders, uh, some folks just have terrible credit scores. Maybe they're in their past. They just were a little deficient on some of those, those requirements. Um, but they do have the money to pay for, uh, or afford, uh, and to take out a loan. So we, offer another element for lenders to be able to vet and say, okay, this person has a low credit score, but they have a high paying job and maybe we should consider them. Um, so things like that as well. And just this um, plethora of, of data that we get from these payroll platforms, um, that's just going to be the the start to a bunch of whole new products and um, just really building out uh, essentially, like you know, like an income bureau, so to speak, and it's kind of like our end goal. So that's uh, really what we're doing. And with all those aforementioned points, security is a tremendous thing. There, I mean, we're we're dealing with logging into payroll providers and how do we deal with that data. So that's security is top of mind for everything that we do. Um, you know, in terms of discussions with our product team and with our engineering team. Um, it's a positive thing that we're still relatively small. I think we're quite smaller than Drada at this point. I mean, we have like, you know, a little under, uh, under 100 employees, uh, but it's still small enough where my team uh, is able to kind of have tentacles everywhere and just make sure that we are involved and we're making sure that, um, you know, nothing kind of falls through the cracks in terms of uh, proper vetting, uh, whether it be external, um, you know, supply chain folks or just our internal engineers. And I think something you just mentioned is like, obviously security is top of mind. You deal with a lot of sensitive data. I know you all have your SOC too. You have your ISO and you have PCI. So I wanted to know, like, I wanted to know, I know you mentioned kind of having a security first culture is really important. And so what is the one thing, I know there's not, there's many things, but like if we could boil it down to one thing, what is the one thing companies need to do if they're looking to accomplish the same goal that you've accomplished at Pinwheel? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it really comes down to as the security leader, making sure that you meet with all of the executives and department leads and ensure that really security trickles down and to ensure that these department leads hold their staff accountable because like one rogue engineer or one rogue uh, product person, one rogue, anything uh, can really take a company down. I mean, you know, the whole concept of shadow IT is a big concern. I mean, someone just, especially in startup land, when somebody just has access to a corporate card. And so that would be something that I want to make sure that our uh, head of finance knows that like we, that's unacceptable. So sometimes disciplinary action and just like codifying that this is not acceptable uh, is really going to push that security first. 
because again, it's like, we're not just in this to, for commercial reasons. I mean, again, that's definitely, and as Mac and attest is, is an important part of our job because, you know, we want to make sure that we're selling and built and, and, um, you know, evangelizing our product, but it's also, we want to protect the data. We, we want to do our diligence and do as best as we possibly can to secure things. So that is, um, absolutely important as well. And I think that's something that's really important. It's like at Drata, our core values are something that's very important to us. And it has to trickle down from leadership. It can't just be, hey, someone like it is your, let's say it's like our CEO, Adam. Yes, it's his responsibility in a way, but all leadership has to be on board. And now I'm bought in as an employee as more of an, well, I'm, I manage, but as an individual contributor in a way, I have to make sure that my reps are also on board. And so it's kind of that, I agree with you, that trickle down effect. And I think something you also talked about, about is the security first culture. So me as, as the sales side, understanding, okay, how do I best work with you as a CISO and making sure we're not sending you every single questionnaire <laughs> or that every single questionnaire, but also why is this important? Why is like data encrypted at rest important to us or building it from the start. So rather than us having to relearn and say, okay, now I have to go and do this training and I never did this from the get go. That's a lot harder for me to learn as a salesperson than it's just part of the way things work. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think a lot of folks, especially at startups, they, I think they understand how important security is. They might not know exactly what they need to do, but they know that like if the company is breached, God forbid, or if there's some kind of major problem, like that's going to be a big problem for the company and they don't want to be the ones that were responsible. So I think a lot of people care, and especially here. Uh, and I'm sure Drata as well, you guys are an actual security compliance company. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's striking that balance. You don't want to go, I mean, in my opinion, again, others might feel differently, but like doing going overboard with security awareness training and we're like, it's just like another one of these things. I think that might not be the best path, but it's definitely important. And, and like phishing simulation training, which I do find value in, but then all of a sudden, like it becomes a little burdensome. So I think it's like, you got to strike that balance. Um, but I do think these processes as a whole are invaluable. Because there's a lot of, especially with, in, in, and I think we'll probably briefly talk about this, like AI, that is, it's going to introduce a lot of very sophisticated threats, at least from what I'm reading and what I'm seeing. Uh, so I think we just want to be ready for it. And I think we're fortunate here at, at Pinwheel, we have a very tech aware workforce. And it's probably similar at Drata, where again, like half the company's engineers, these they they know at at least at a high level what like what's going on, but that's not the same at a lot of other companies where folks this is kind of new to them. And what is this phishing email actually looks pretty good. Maybe I should click this. So we just <laughs> want to make sure that they that they don't make that click. <laughs> I should go send my I should go send Adam Markowitz five hundred Uber gift cards or should yeah, I do that? Exactly. Just kidding. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Kayla asked a really tough question there, Jeff. I thought you did a really good job answering it. That, well, you know, what one thing should you do as a security leader? And I'm like, oh man, I mean, there's no silver bullets, right? And so it comes down to like, <laughs> hey, what's in our bucket of lead bullets that we're going to use to help attack this, you know, multi-genre security, uh, you know, issue we're trying to attack. And, you know, I, I, I love realizing that every company is on its on their own security journey that everyone's working towards that. And, and I realize a lot of camaraderie between CISOs as a result of that, a lot of patience towards each other. Uh, you know, definitely uh, the, from a competition standpoint, it's not like any one of us would wish any harm on each other or, or wish exactly. an incident on each other. And so it, it's just nice to have that kind of camaraderie amongst each other. And I, I like that you started out with talking about the number one thing being connecting with leaders internally. Um, I definitely feel like the connections and relationships with others at companies has made or break or broken kind of the security uh, influence or culture at a company. And I'm glad that you, you brought that up. Um, you know, as we talk about building a security culture, uh, I talk about the two different things. There's, there's building in security and then there's bolting on security. Uh, you know, when you've approached your security programs or in working with Pinwheel or, or other companies in general, what are some key things that you've done to help build in that security versus kind of retroactively bolting it on? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think 
building those processes um, around security reviews of what we call, you know, PRDs, new products, and then spikes, which are like the technical implementations, like ensuring that that's like absolutely necessary. That security needs to be involved in these processes. But I also do love things that are, you know, automated like we do, we all do, and especially at a startup. So the aforementioned uh, phylum, like things where every single commit is getting scanned for dependencies and is there any risk associated with them? We use things like Dependabot. We actually built our own um, open source um, platform for um, taking Dependabot vulnerability information and piping it to Slack. And like it shows us kind of what the situation is. So things like that, I think, do a tremendous amount. Um, so yeah, I mean, bolting on, I definitely think is harder. And but it's, it's, it's inevitable because we're going to learn, like, man, I'm sure you and I will both learn, like, oh, wait, like, there's discussion around this new security feature, or I'm sorry, this new product feature. It's like, oh, wait, like, we probably should secure that a little better than, like, I guess, that are currently in the plans. Um, so just trying to avoid things like that. But again, we know that that's definitely going to happen, at least at some point. No, totally. And having grace towards folks is that gets come, you know, those things come up as well. Um, I, uh, I like that you had bias towards automation. It seems like in order to run fast alongside of all of our developers, having the automation embedded in the process really helps them feel emboldened with what they need to know at the time they're cutting code or working on new products. Um, and, and some of the other things, uh, kind of like you mentioned, which was being a part of the product, uh, the PRD reviews and stuff like that. Uh, you know, giving guidance on when you would like to talk to your engineering and, and infrastructure SRE team members about hey, like if you're going to change our authentication scheme, that might be something we should chat about before doing it. Or, okay, if it's just a normal like, hey, I want to improve or close out this bug that doesn't impact anything security related, then go, go, go. Like, really want to move fast. So I like that you mentioned kind of the automation piece there. I want to talk, we want to kind of switch and talk about trends and security compliance and generally uh, as we move forward in the space. I, I'm actually really impressed with and grateful for your contributions in kind of the, you know, this space doing podcasts and, and posting stuff on blog posts or stuff on LinkedIn. I think it's helpful to learn from you and, and to see that you've shared stuff to help all of us continue to learn and grow and think about things that we haven't thought about before. And I think recently, um, you know, on a female blog post, uh, you know, you talked about kind of the increasing popularity of AI uh, in, in our organizations, and it's a pretty hot topic right now and pretty exciting to see the things we learn together in this space. You know, I've seen some companies take this super draconian approach, which is like, you know, we don't use this at all because of the privacy or, or other kind of implications relying on some of the output of these tools. Um, what are some things that you've been able to do to educate your team members and protecting your company uh, from some of these risks associated with AI use inside your company? Yeah, I, I think it's definitely a really challenging thing. And I've been doing a ton of reading. I mean, I remember, I think, you're, you might be a member as well. There are these like CISO uh, groups on Slack and I just try and hear what other folks are doing. Uh, but something that I, and I also wanted to collaborate with our general counsel, because again, they have, should have some say there as well. But again, the first iteration was more just vetting the certain solutions, seeing what kind of privacy, um, what kind of privacy features they offer and what like, is like is our input going to be going to their models? Like that's a huge question right there. Um, and again, like not even that doesn't give us assurance because like we've already seen that. I mean, not to mention any names of products, but they've had their little security woes. So again, like in my opinion, we have found a few products that have given us given us assurance that they're not going to train in our information. And internally, we also advise on not sharing um, obviously sensitive company information. Again, if you're going to use code, if you're going to try and, um, because again, I think that's super powerful to have AI, like fix your code, find your bugs, then just replace variable names, replace function names, just as really try and go in there and just try to uh, obscure it as much as you possibly can uh, to, to lessen the risk. Again, I think this is like a, a very... Uh, this is definitely going to evolve as time goes by. That's my current feeling. Um, you know, it's just like through discussions to the company, it's like, okay, so we have these three or four approved solutions. This is how you, how you have to use them. But again, as we're seeing how fast this is moving, I mean, that could completely change in a month. <laughs> so it's just like, it's tricky. 
Um, but, but, but Matt, I would actually, I mean, I know I, don't really, I hate to turn the tables here, but I'd be curious to how you see it and how you guys are doing it there at the Drada. No, no, absolutely. I'm glad you kind of reflected it there too. Um, even just in general, talking to some of my peers, security architects and engineers that are building stuff from the ground up, it's amazing to see how that initial, say, usually would take two to three to four weeks in engineering code to stand up infrastructure, do some security engineering capabilities internally. You can do it in a matter of hours, just working with a, <laughs> a chat, you know, and, and it's, inc- and, and all of that, but generally pretty reasonably good start. Um, I know, yeah. you know, as I've written things in the past, starting from nothing is definitely a whole lot harder than starting from something, uh, especially <laughs> when you want to get your thoughts put together. And so having that already spit out code that's generally deployable into AWS and other stuff is, is pretty you know, fascinating to say the least, but also pretty scary too, right? To say, hey, like, can I truly trust this and say, hey, let's go and just ship this right now? Like, no, we probably should check this out before we go forward with it. But, you know, from my end, echoing similar things that you're saying, which is, you know, there's a lot of risks around kind of poisoning the uh, kind of the, the models, right, to give us information that may not be as reliable. Uh, definitely kind of need to be careful on what information we're putting in for the purpose of sharing with other organizations that may be trade secret, like you mentioned, which is great. I liked how you mentioned talking to general counsel or your CLO to say, hey, uh, some companies, you know, the CISO wears privacy hat. Some companies, the CLO wears the privacy hat. And just understanding, hey, what are the true implications from a privacy standpoint that that, that we need to be aware of here as we, we want? Because we want to embolden our people to move as fast as they're able to go. Uh, and at the same time, also want to make sure we're protected from an IP standpoint, from uh, kind of like just general risks that may come out from just directly using what's thrown back at us. So, um, you know, super, super helpful. I, I've been trying to figure out, hey, from a CISO standpoint, what's a way that might enable us in our roles uh, from an AI standpoint? You know, some folks, they'll just go straight to, you know, chat GPT and start actually saying, hey, how do I do this? Uh, and, and they're able to move forward. I, I think about our roles and think, hey, how can we further embolden ourselves with, you know, that capability to start out with, uh, with various pieces there? And I haven't yet been able to crack that um, other than just kind of having something to start out with with regard to different tones and, or even just having fun trying to, to, to crack some of the content filters as, as a fun pastime, but uh, generally yeah, yeah, yeah. it's been kind of fun to try to figure out what, what makes the most sense for us. So um, have you personally found it useful to use personally in your role um, to start with that now, or have you felt like it's been okay. more on the technical Probably side? The best started? thing that I got from uh, AI was coming up with our AI policy. No, no, I'm kidding. I mean, the, I mean, I've actually read people using it, which is like absolutely, <laughs> I don't say absurd, it's kind of interesting, I guess. Sometimes I'll just ask questions about like, how would you go about exploring Exploiting just to kind of see how, you know, I think some of its answers in, in how to exploit certain either physical security situations or, um, but yeah, I just think it's, it's going to change a lot of things dramatically. Um, I mean, security, I mean, like Matt, as, as you know, and I'm sure Kayla too, like we, we've known that people, folks have been dropping AI forever. And to the degree they're actually using AI, I mean, I'm sure some of them are, some of them would be more really research centric companies, but a lot of them are probably just like using very, very primitive um, uh, aspects of it. But yeah, like once, once chat GPT came out, um, I think that really changed all of our minds of what's next. I mean, having this language model that's actually able to communicate like a human is, uh, is really going to have dramatic uh, implications in the future. Um, so I think it's really important that defenders, um, as you guys are to a certain extent, I mean, I know you're mostly in compliance, but it, it's going to be really important that we, uh, we leverage this to make sure that we can fight the bad guys that are going to be using it too. Absolutely. One of the things recently I've been thinking about was, you know, as you come to a new organization, there's so much open source intelligence you can gather about a company and understanding, hey, what is my true perimeter? Uh, you know, obviously we're trying to focus on zero trust across the board, but you know, one of those areas really is that perimeter to say, what am I exposed to? How do I know that I can't be hit by some common drive-by right now? Um, it's gonna be interesting to see how using AI to basically generate a full dossier on the company's cybersecurity footprint on the, the public internet yeah. is gonna be super useful for us to know where to start from. Uh, among other kind of solutions that are out there. But I'm really, really excited about the uh, potentials there. Yeah, absolutely. I think so too. 
And I think like the uh, challenge, and this goes back to what we were saying earlier on the like, plethora of things. Like, I mean, like some new thing pops up and it's like, it becomes like another security review of it. And like, so how do we, as a, you know, we have a relatively small security team, like how can we keep up? So that's something that I think is uh, definitely in the works. I mean, fortunately now I think a lot of, of these tools are kind of funneling through a very small amount of models or companies like OpenAI and, and Google, but that definitely could change. So I know Amazon's getting into it. And so uh, keeping tabs on that is definitely going to be a challenge for security teams, but I have no doubt that we'll, uh, we will uh, keep on top of it. So I want to, I know you, talked about like new things popping up and kind of competing priorities. And I also read your article along with Matt, and I know you talked about some of the benefits of tying a CISO, which include improved security, enhanced compliance, improved risk management, better decision-making and improved reputation. And so you have all these benefits. So how do you as CISO at Pinwheel kind of balance all of these and keep all of these top of mind when they could also like, they all obviously work together, but it's kind of competing and like, where are you putting your time and effort? There's a lot of where automation comes in, where we can automate third party reviews. Again, it's not just like fully automated where it's like, okay, like your, your past, you can go again, if this is something where they're going to be having access to our critical data and things like that, that would go through much more scrutiny. Um, but yeah, I think automation is really key here. And um we just recently took on another security, a very strong security engineer that's helping us automate these things. So um, I want to make sure that we hit, because I, I don't want to get like get spread too thin where the value of all the aforementioned things you just brought up, Kayla, are just like the quality is horrendous. Um, and, I, and just so I can pass the audit. Um, yeah. <laughs> again, I want to pass the audit. Let's not be, yes. uh, you know. but, um, but I also want to make sure that like, we're doing what we should be doing and like just given all the su supply chain risks that we're seeing and it's it's something that and that 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 also comes to and this is one of the values of iso 27001 never thought i would say something like this in terms of just like both like these kind of frameworks but the information security steering committee aspect of it where we speak at a it's like a risk committee slash executive committee and we can talk about i'll talk about the risk assessments we're doing i'll talk about um, compliance and privacy, um, you know, projects we're working on and, and we can get, you know, feedback from them about what are their priorities. Um, and I think that definitely helps us guide our, uh, our goal setting and uh, making sure that we're, uh, doing the best we possibly can to secure our customers' data and our, our company as a whole. And I, I think you brought up a really good point is obviously. CISOs are spread very thin. I think that is a very yeah. true fact. And so doing things right. So for example, like not having exceptions. Yes, you could have a SOC 2 and have 100 exceptions. But when companies are seriously thinking about doing business with you and they see all those exceptions, if they are relevant to um, what you want to see, that's going to be a red flag and they're not going to do business with you. Yes, there may be companies that just say, cool, you have your SOC 2, we're good to go. But any serious company is going to actually look at that and say, look at your attestation and say, hey, actually, we're not willing to work with you because the risk is too high. So I think it's really important what you talked about of like doing things right and making sure that you're not spread too thin and knowing, I guess, as a CISO, you have to know where that limit exists, right? And, and when do you hit that? And then, okay, I need to hire on someone new or I need to hire on two new people or at the pace that you grow and really having a sense of that kind of boundary or when your, I guess your cup is full. Yeah. I mean, that's a fantastic point. And to your, I've noticed, and again, Matt, I'm not, I'm not sure if you've noticed this as well. I've noticed that the, um, the length and of the security questionnaires have actually kind of decreased over time, uh, which is phenomenal, but that doesn't also, that also means that like we get a lot of follow-up questions. We'll have a lot of like discussions and be like, well, how are you doing this? Maybe you show us how you're doing this, which I think is good. I mean, I think, you know, we target, I think, as I mentioned, the biggest banks in the U S uh, we're targeting the biggest fintechs. So like these, these big companies, they want to make sure that we're, we're doing things right. And not just from like a cursory SOC 2, not saying SOC 2 is not valuable. I really think 
SOCTU is tremendously valuable, especially for newer companies to show that like they're taking security seriously. They have you know, rudimentary processes. Um, but yeah, to that, like Kayla, to your point of like real security, they want to see the real security. And they want to know that we're actually doing something. And um, yeah, that becomes very uh, important for us as well. I love and totally resonate with your observation there. Like life being short, precious, and want to live it intentionally. It's nice that the questions that are being asked are questions that really do aim at the, how can I use my time as effectively as possible to evaluate this third and fourth party? And what are the questions that really matter in determining their true risk in our whole posture? And if they really are going to be one of the weakest links in the whole chain of third parties. And so uh, I have seen the same thing, um, you know, and have seen more and more, like you said, follow-up questions as well. It is nice, though, when you do have something like a trust center or a place where customers can go and become educated on your security processes and compliance processes to the point that they come back with very pointed questions uh, that are like, hey, I noticed that you had this pen test and this is one of the findings and it says it's unresolved. And so it's very pointed in that way and um, just ends up being a very effective use of time at that point versus kind of a here's here's a couple hundred questions, answer these and never hear back being that you guys are much more informed about these products than I am, uh, do you feel that customers really value that trust center? I mean, they're, you know, we, we either uploaded the document or there was an actual check against AWS or whatever your cloud provider is. Do you see that they, they have a lot of value in that? Oh, absolutely. And, and Kayla, I'd love to hear your thoughts here too, but uh, at some of the other companies have been at where they service enterprise customers, um, you know, one of our values here and generally personally, one of my own personal values is transparency it really is the foundation stone to building trust with anyone, whether it be an organization, another person, a team member. And so getting your security program to the point where you can be just as transparent about how you're doing things as almost anything else really shows that you want to build that relationship of trust with your customers to the point that they feel like, Okay, while this while this company is just as impenetrable as my own, they really are trying to do their best, just like we are, to 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 go after the most um, you know uh, impactful risks that may you know beset them. And so it's it's very very cool to see companies take that more transparent approach. And I feel like it's a little more warm as well, where it's more welcoming to say, look, like we're all in this together and, and we're really trying to figure out security and we really want to make a dent against the bad guys out there or even just out of the negligence or things that may come after us. And so the fact that people are being more transparent by using these kinds of trust centers, I think it's been helpful to say, look, like you can read a marketing page and it will say everything amazing about security. Now you can go a step further and you can review our policies and you can review, you know, even if you want to comment on the formatting of our policies to say, this is not super polished, but you know, anything like the long, those kind of things, but <laughs> it's just kind of fun to get feedback as well. And not only that, it also opens the door for feedback. I've gotten some great feedback from other security teams in the past where they may say, Hey, you know, this particular aspect may be stronger uh, for customers in our space in the enterprise space or the FinTech space. If you know, you add this Component of this aspect to your trust center. And so having that ongoing dialogue to help each other out, I think has ended up being a really positive in this, in this space. Something I would add to that also on the sales side is a, me and my team and, and the sales team are also are always thinking about what is the best experience for the prospect? And so, or at least trying to, right? We're making an effort. And <laughs> it's not fun for a prospect to want to learn about your security posture, it's needing your SOC 2, and then it says contact sales. That's a, not a great experience for the process, prospect. So when we're thinking about it, at least gives them the ability to request it. And then your sales ops team or whoever can say, yes, this, this isn't a competitor or whoever this is, yes, they have permission to see these documents. So when we're thinking about, and as on the sales side of things, that's a way easier workflow than someone coming in and saying, hey, we're gonna work with you. Now, can you get this? Maybe there's something I have to go back to Matt's team and say, hey, we need this, this piece of information when maybe it's just a policy where we could have had it on the website and someone could have just requested to see it. I think it also helps with passive buyers where it's not going to be the necessarily the make or break for doing business with you, but they'll see it and they'll understand, Hey, this company is taking their security posture seriously. And I've always, I've already built this kind of inherent trust with this company. 
and I gravitate towards this company because I know that they're doing the right things. Yes, I may look at the stock too, and maybe there's exceptions, and then maybe I don't do business with them. But <laughs> on face value, it starts to build that trust from the first touch point. Even if I'm not coming in and saying, hey, can I see your stock too? I at least have trust on your website of saying, hey, I know that you're doing the right things and that you care about this. And that's important to me because I don't, I want to make sure that my data is protected and you are doing the right thing. So I think it's kind of that first step also for passive buyers who aren't say, who aren't necessarily talking to sales yet, but it's something when they're doing their evaluations on their own that they're saying, this is something that's important to us. So as a salesperson, I, I really like it. And then when thinking about prospect and kind of their journey, they're not always coming in and saying, Hey, can I see this? Maybe they just want to see proof. And that kind of builds that trust with the company from the get-go. As we wrap up, you know, I think about us as CISOs, we, we truly are, you know, take and still from Game of Thrones, like we are the watchers at the wall. We're trying to figure out, <laughs> hey, what are the next trends of things to come after us? Uh, and mm -hmm. so I'm curious, you know, as you think ahead, you know, what are some cybersecurity trends that you're seeing and kind of expect to see in the next year that we need to be kind of aware of and ready to, to protect ourselves against? adding complexity, the, the, the constant adding complexity of the cloud in like an AWS or whether it be Google Cloud or, or, or Azure, um, you might have SREs that are going to overlook new things. I mean, like it used to be, and I'm sure this is still a problem, like S3 buckets that are public that have like military secrets. I mean, I know that's those things have happened before. Um, and I'm sure your company and as well as the other security compliance companies do help find those things, but I'm sure they're in the future, they're going to be more things and more things that might not default to secure. They might default to everything is open. So I think that's another uh, thing that I want to make sure that um, security teams are aware of and can help protect against. But I'm actually very curious, Matt, I'm sorry to put the ball back in your corner, no. but how would you, uh, what are some of your concerns and uh, the, uh, the upcoming? Yeah, no, no. So, so echoing the same things as you were saying, uh, one thing I would add to, and I think you had a, just a really good list of what to be prepared for is operating a security program can be very costly and very burdensome for a company. And so I think about the tools that we're using, I think there's a, there's a big potential consolidation of a lot of tools versus like people going after best of breed to, you know, single platform. And so actually operationalizing your security program into optimizing the best of what's out there because the capabilities in the security space, security tool space specifically have really continued to accelerate to the point of figuring out, hey, what uh, what, what other things do we need to do to make sure that we can further unite and, and get the best bang for a buck? Uh, I think another big challenge from an operational standpoint, again, these aren't necessarily security risks or things to be aware of, but just to be prepared for, is just around really truly quantifying risks. Uh, generally, I think of risk management as strategically letting certain fires burn while you attack bigger fires. Um, <laughs> and, and with that, trying to figure out what the most, you know, brightly burning fires are out there that we need to go and attack as a team to, to most you know, use our time effectively. And so, um, but yeah, no, as long as, long as, you know, as, as far as the threats go, that you just talked about, you know, along with you know, AI, uh, various threats that continue to go out there. I think I read this morning, just various numbers of malware that continue to plague our world. Uh, new vectors found there. I think are going to continue to be there. Ransomware being another one. Um, phishing. Gosh, I, I still feel sad that as much as we can do in that space, phishing and social engineering, it sounds defeatist to say, uh, could continue to be an effective way uh, to, to get into our companies. And, and that's really frustrating, but also continues to pose a challenge that, uh, that we can fight against. So I appreciate you reflecting the question well, there so we can learn together too. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, one more question before we wrap up. So tell us <laughs> where people can learn about Pinwheel. Yeah, please. Um, please come to our website, pinwheelapi.com. And uh, or please reach out to me at uh, jeff at pinwheelapi.com. I would love to answer any of your questions. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. This was an awesome conversation. And Matt, thank you for co-hosting. Likewise, thank you so much, Jeff. I count myself lucky to work along amazing folks like yourself and uh, looking forward to learn from more in the future. Thank you for listening to Compliance Uncomplicated, a Drata podcast. 
To learn more about the series, go to drada.com slash uncomplicated. Discuss this episode on our community secured at community.drada.com or subscribe to our newsletter, Trusted, to stay up to date on the latest episodes.